On this week's episode, we're talking about the 13th President of the United States, Millard Fillmore. He wasn't one of the most popular or even well-known of the presidents, but we've discovered some very interesting pieces of information that may surprise you. Additionally, we'll be visiting Fillmore's home that he built for his first wife, Abigail, that's in East Aurora, New York, as well as visiting his final resting place at Forest Lawn Cemetery in Buffalo. So please, join us as we partake on this little piece of the past, right here on History and Relics. Born in a log cabin on January 7, 1800, Fillmore spent much of his youth clearing land and raising crops on the 130-acre farm that his father leased in New York's Finger Lakes region. Though he had little formal schooling, he rose from poverty by diligent self-study to become a successful attorney. He was admitted to the bar at age 23 and had a successful law practice in Buffalo. He became prominent in the Buffalo area as an attorney and politician. He was elected to the New York Assembly in 1828 and to the House of Representatives in 1832. Initially, he belonged to the Anti-Masonic Party, but later became a member of the Whig Party as formed in the mid-1830s, founded by Henry Clay. As a Whig, Fillmore served three terms in the House, lost a race for New York governor, became New York's comptroller, and then received a surprise nomination to be Zachary Taylor's running mate in the 1848 presidential election. Taylor and Fillmore took the White House with 47% of the popular vote. During Fillmore's time as vice president, Taylor's administration largely left him out of the decision-making process. But on July 4, 1850, Taylor came down with a stomach virus after attending a 4th of July celebration at the Washington Monument. His doctors, following the since discredited medical practices of the era, gave him a mercury compound called calomel and induced bleeding and blisters. Within days, Taylor was dead and Fillmore rose to the presidency. Some other U.S. presidents never elected to the office were John Tyler, Andrew Johnson, Chester Arthur, and Gerald Ford. Fillmore, along with Tyler, Johnson, and Arthur, had no second in command for the entirety of their terms. This situation is unlikely to repeat itself, however, as the 25th Amendment, ratified in 1967, allows the president to appoint a vice president subject to the approval of Congress. Though personally opposed to slavery, Fillmore valued the preservation of the Union above all. As a result, he supported the Compromise of 1850 a package of bills that allowed the newly formed territories of New Mexico and Utah to decide the slavery question for themselves. It also admitted California as a free state, banned the slave trade, but not slavery itself, in Washington, D.C., and settled the Texas boundary dispute as well as authorized the use of federal officers to capture runaway slaves. Fillmore wrote after the bill's passage, the long agony is over. These several acts are not in all respects what I would have desired, yet I am rejoiced at their passage and trust they will restore harmony and peace to our distracted country. In his best efforts, given the circumstances at the time, Fillmore's actions via the Compromise of 1850 did stave off a civil war from occurring at that point, but the war would eventually break out in 1861. Fillmore's father purportedly only owned three books, a Bible, a hymn book, and an almanac. Yet Fillmore became a bibliophile anyway, carrying a dictionary with him at all times in order to improve his vocabulary. As president, he and his wife Abigail 
founded the first permanent White House Library. He also reportedly raced to help fight a December 1851 fire at the Library of Congress, then signed a bill to fund the replacement of all the books that had been destroyed. Recognizing that the fugitive slave provision was the main concession to the South in the Compromise of 1850, Fillmore strictly enforced it. In doing so, however, he enraged Northern abolitionists. At the 1852 Whig Convention in Baltimore, Fillmore's main support came from Southern delegates, and he lost on the 53rd ballot to Winfield Scott, a veteran of numerous wars. Winfield Scott's unsuccessful Whig candidacy for the White House marked the beginning of the end for the Whig Party and made Millard Fillmore the last Whig president. Fillmore was the first president to return to private life without independent wealth or the possession of a landed estate. With no pension to anticipate, he needed to earn a living and felt that it should be, in a way, that would uphold the dignity of his former office. His friend, Judge Hall, assured him that it would be proper for him to practice law in the higher courts of New York. So that's what Fillmore intended to do. But then tragedy struck in 1853 and 1854, when Abigail developed pneumonia after attending President Pierce's inauguration and died on March 30th. 1853. Then, on July 26, 1854, he lost his only daughter, Mary, to cholera. But the lure of politics proved too strong to keep him away for too long. In January 1855, Fillmore effectively announced his candidacy for president. The election did not go well for him, though, as he carried just one state, Maryland, and 22 percent of the popular vote. On February 10, 1858, Fillmore remarried to Caroline McIntosh, a wealthy widow. The pair later purchased a large house on Niagara Square in Buffalo, where they lived for the remainder of their life. They were devoted to philanthropy and helped found the Buffalo General Hospital. Caroline later died on August 11, 1881. Fillmore died on March 8, 1874, at the age of 74, after suffering a series of strokes. He's buried at Forest Lawn Cemetery in Buffalo, New York. Let's now visit Forest Lawn and pay our respects before heading over to Millard's and Abigail's home. Now a quick word about Millard's only son, Millard Powers Fillmore, who is also buried here. He never married and was the last family member, thus the Fillmore lineage ended with him. His will directed that all of his family correspondence, including his father's, be burned. The motive behind this remains a mystery and the subject of much speculation. President Fillmore built this house in 1826 for his bride, Abigail, and is where they lived until about 1830. It is the only home in the country actually built by a president, and is the only house besides the White House still standing that Fillmore lived in. Amazingly, the home still retains its original wood floors, and even the original front door and all its hardware. Timbers in the house are hand-hewed and fastened with wooden pegs. The house originally stood on Main Street, near the Aurora Theater building. It stood in disrepair for many years, until Irving Price of Fisher Price Toys purchased the home in 1930 for his wife Margaret, who was enchanted with the little house and its history. The home was moved to its present location at 24 Shearer Avenue, East Aurora, where it was remodeled for Margaret's art studio. She later became the toy company's first art director. The Aurora Historical Society acquired the home in 1975 and began returning it back to circa 1826. 
Thank you for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed our program. If you like our content, we ask that you give us a thumbs up, a like, share with your friends, subscribe to our channel, and ring that notification bell so you always know when our new content is published. And all of this costs nothing but means a lot to us and keeps us growing. You may also leave us a tip if you choose. The address is provided here on your screen and a link is provided in the description area below. So until next time everyone, this one is history. Hey and be sure to check out our eBay store under ID History and Relics. We're now featuring channel merchandise starting with our new logo magnet. They're only $5.50 and net proceeds go towards supporting our channel.